Hello, I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. Dr. Janicek, Gary Goldstein's on the phone for you. It's usually the people that have tried everything else on their own. Conventional medicine's really not getting it. They're not getting into the causes and stuff, and that's, that's when we de develop our protocols. There's some stress techniques that I've learned through, I have a, a master's in neuro-linguistic programming and uh, clinical hypnosis. And people don't realize that the, most of the stuff that's stressing them out is a meaning that they've given something. I got into chiropractic because of an epileptic condition. Since I was four years old, I was having these seizures. I had a mom come in, and this is how usually it comes in. Somebody comes in, headache, neck pain, back pain. Through conversation, they hear my story. Well, one of the ladies had had a son that was about four years old, and she said, oh, well, he's having seizures, and he's having trouble in class, and, and mom came back in and said, oh my gosh, you know, the teachers are calling, he's so good in class, they think he, that he's on medication. I actually took him off his medication, he's doing so Today, good. Today, we're interviewing Dr. Bill Janishek, a chiropractor in California, and we'll be going through his career and some of the interesting things that have happened to him and that he's done throughout that illustrious career. Bill, welcome. Well, thank you. It's, it's always a pleasure to be here with you. Good, I've known you for a while. I always talk about that, so yeah, I, I'm really excited about this, and uh, yeah, have a great chat. I'd like to start out with some of your achievements and so they can understand some of the things you've done. How long have you been in practice, Bill? I graduated in 96, so about 25 years. 25 years, same as me. I'm so excited to hear that. And, and we've been friends for a number of years now through, through uh, supplement companies and through neurology and through chiropractic and through functional medicine and uh, rehabilitation through brain waves. It's, it's been pretty cool stuff. We've, we've looked at the issues of personal injury together and what's going on with that in the world. And, um, and now I understand that you are a best-selling author. Can you talk about that, that achievement for us? Yeah, you know, that, that's an interesting, you know, for as much as we talk and, and how much rabbit hole stuff that we go through on the clinical aspects, you know, uh, patient treatment, neurology, and things, it's actually a, a personal development book. It's an interesting story. I'm part of a group. Most of my friends are they're fairly well-known speakers or authors and they're in the personal development space. So I kind of like hang around that area. So I belong to a group, it's called Next Level by Association. And one of my good friends, Bob Donnell, just knows a lot of people. And so once a month we have just dinner with, with uh, certain people. And I met somebody um, named Greg Reed and he was the He's, he was the president of the Napoleon Hill Foundation. Napoleon Hill, for the, re, the listeners that don't know, uh, he wrote like the, the Bible of personal development. It's called Think and Grow Rich. Anyways, we chatted on that. And then the next month, there was Gary Goldstein, who's a Hollywood producer. He produced Pretty Woman, Under Siege. And it was, it was funny. I was at my office and I was walking from my office over to treat patients. We were getting busy. And my front office girl said, Dr. Janicek, Gary Goldstein's on the phone for you. And I'm like, wow, big Hollywood producers calling me. What's up with that? And um, I said, well, call him. You know, I'm busy. I said, you know, get his number. I'll call him back. And I thought to myself, I'm like, wow, how surreal. I said, you know, it was Hollywood producers. Well, my people will call your people. We'll figure something out later. Anyways, I called him back and I thanked him for following up. And he said, you know, I was just really interested about what we talked about last. And for the life of me, I couldn't figure, I don't remember what was so dang interesting that we had talked about it, but he was friends with Greg Reed, who had spoke before. He said, you know, we're doing a book, would like to have you help out with it. You know, and I'm thinking, well, I own a truck. He, he probably wants me to go and help deliver them. I go, sure. Yeah. You know, whatever I can, you know, I can deliver them. I can package them up. Um, anything to help a new friend. Sure. And it took him a couple minutes to actually get it through my thick noggin that he actually wanted me to give content for a chapter in the book. And I'm like, um, so every fiber in my being said, no, stay in your lane. This is not, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. And my mouth said, yes. And then he said, great. And he hung up and I said, I'll be in touch. And I was just, I'm like, wow. And then I thought to myself, I said, well, this much must be what growth feels like because I'm, a, I'm afraid, but I'm doing it anyways. So as it turned out, you know, I, I didn't sit down and type out a bunch of stuff. I, I made some outlines. He had a real writer come in and clean up my 
uh, my commas and my periods and my semicolons. And they put together a really nice book called Initiative. And, um, and it was headlined, everybody had a different chapter. So there was uh, people like uh, Les Brown, who's a fairly well-known speaker and Jim Rohn and Gary Goldstein had something. And so they all had following. So I am a best-selling author because I'm part of the book. Um, but don't mistake that for that I was any good. In <laughs> but we were there. And that was the first, the first portion of it. And that stayed on the bestseller list through Amazon for, I don't know, quite a while, just because of the, the way it's marketed and stuff. But it was, it's, it's actually a cute little story if you guys get a chance to get that. It's a quick read, and it's about a little girl that uh, kind of lost her way and meets all these different people, me being one of them, on, on the way with different advice and how their life turns out. Oh, good. Well, we'll post that link on the, on the comments below, and I, that's, that's very exciting. I've heard you tell some of that story before, and it's, it's cool every time I hear it, and it's different every time I hear it. <laughs> it's, it like I said, it, it's like, wow, I'm really scared right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I makes sense it makes sense but it's such a such a neat thing um what was the work that you did for the la tribune oh well, la tribune yeah you know it's so it's very interesting is i had another friend that knew the new owner of the paper and he was taking it over and they were going to a digital model and he was telling them about me and the kind of work that we do with uh, neurology and functional medicine and how and he thought it was very interesting and uh, he called me up just to talk about, he, was, he wanted to make an appointment. And he said, what you do is amazing. And we were just having a conversation and they ended up doing an article on me about, uh, you know, chiropractors in the area, what we were actually doing, the things that we kind of do a little bit different in, in the office. And so we were, there was a nice write up from that. So that began a relationship. And I was just asking him about the LA Tribune and, and, what exactly it is i don't know i'm just a curious guy by nature so I, i'm very interested and he said well we're looking for a writer for the the health issue and we have we're having some of these online summits uh would you like to participate and i said sure and again just like when the book came i'm like i don't know really what i'm doing but i'm game you know i i've embarrassed myself enough through my life that i really don't care at this point but it's i i like new experiences and so from that point on you know, just like when we have conversations, different thoughts come up and different questions. We investigate the thoughts and we come up with a conclusion or more questions or something. And that's basically all it is. So I, there's some articles that I put out. I, I do the summits with them. Usually I handle the health or commentary or something. And sometimes it's just a matter of using some logical thought during conversations or I'll mediate something. So you, you know how people with opinions can get out of hand. So we just want to bring it back and, um, and get with that. So the, my role has expanded. And from that, I met Goldie Locks, who she, she, uh, she has a band, but she's probably best well known. She was uh, one of the managers and one of the old uh, wrestlers on WWE. And the owner of the Tribune said, well, we're starting a new TV channel on Amazon on, you know, through Roku and, and these other things on the LA times channel, you guys should do a show together. So we have a weekly show that we put together and it's all digital. And, um, and it's just, we just have conversations about different topics and she's very social and she's very out there. And then I try to be a little bit more pragmatic and we're, we're an interesting team together. So it's wow. just, it's, it's amazing the way, you know, the roads take you once you start hopping down there. Sure. Well, you're in, you're in your Belinda, California, which is in Orange County, right? Yes. Not quite LA County. No, we're, we're closer to uh, Riverside County. We're on the uh, east end of Orange County. I'm about a half a mile away from the Richard Nixon library. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of our claim to fame over there is Nixon's place. And it's big horse country, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's funny, you know, I live in Norco area, which is Horsetown, USA. And that's really Horsetown. But there is, I've heard there's just 10,000 horses in Yorba Linda, but you really don't see them because they're always on back roads and stuff like that. But it is a big horse community. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, what, what kind of practice have you developed and what kind of patients do you see? What is your typical population like um, in this world of chiropractic that you do? So, you know, when I first started out, it was, you know, anybody with a spine and anybody that would listen to me, let me work out there. But through just years of, you know, learning from your lectures and studies and the stuff we've worked with, uh, personal injury and stuff, I work mostly with adult females with kids and their families uh, on stress-related issues. Of course, you know, we do trauma and we'll do headache, neck pain, back pain, car accident, just like anybody else. But where we really shine is getting to, uh, it's, it's usually the people that have tried everything else on their own. Conventional medicine is really not getting it. They're not getting to the causes of stuff. And that's, that's when we de develop our protocols. And I treat what I call the stress model. And, you know, stress is physical, it's chemical and emotional. And, you know, physical can be uh, your posture, your ergonomics, uh, any traumas that have gone, gone through, any biomechanical issues that you might have, the things that you would think of, you know, a normal chiropractor doing. Then we, I usually do a metabolic assessment form, or if we have said, so we'll look at blood tests, Cyrex labs to look for any other metabolic issues that may be driving or uh, contributing to, you know, thyroid, adrenal, gut, brain stuff. And then um, I do, because there's an emotional component and I never claim to be, uh, I'm not a psychologist and I don't want to be, and I don't do that, but there's some stress techniques that I've learned through, I have a, a master's in neuro-linguistic programming and uh, clinical hypnosis. And so I just give them, there's some simple exercises and there, there's some simple thought patterns that, that will drive a stress response. And that's an emotional because emotion is, um, you know, mental stress. And that's what people think when I say, I'm stressed out. It's usually a mental thing. And people don't realize that the, most of the stuff that's stressing them out is a meaning that they've given something, you know, um, I don't have enough money in the bank account. And, and that could just mean that, oh, I got to wait till Monday till the check comes. Or some people say it means that I'm going to get thrown in my house tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to live on the streets. People are going to think poor. I mean, they'll run down these rabbit holes and they don't even realize that. So there's some techniques that I can sit with people and, and help them repattern that. And, and again, a lot of times I don't even know what their problem is. I just show them how to to manipulate their, their own mind. And which is very interesting because almost immediately you can see a change in their physiology where they'll come down. And I would be very interesting to do a QEG on people during that time to see what actually happens because, you know, we'll see the outside thing, but to get that objective evidence, uh, the kind of stuff that you do, it would be just amazing. Yeah. But I take all those things together and then uh, we build a plan. And um, I, I tell my people that I work with, I don't think of them as patients. I think of them as clients because a patient is somebody comes in with a specific thing. You take care of that one specific thing and then you pat them on the head and you wave goodbye and you hope that everything. A client is somebody that uh, you take care of through their, their different challenges. Some people may not have sports injuries but they may have an ergonomic issue. Somebody might not have a chiropractic issue, but they may have struggling with gluten intolerance. Um, I get some people that call me up just for referrals for painters or plumbers because they trust my, they know that the people that I know that they can trust, they can borrow my credibility in, in that so they don't have to you know, go on Facebook or Yelp and, and figure out, they go, oh, who does Dr. Janishak use? Because you know, I vet people. Yeah, yeah. So that that's that's kind of the uh, the genre of the, that we work in, and I don't like the the rack and crack and the rolls and you know just everybody's the same. Just get the adjustment. Mm -hmm. It would it would, one it would bore me, but two I don't I don't believe that that's what you know. There's not a one size fit all physiology we all come in with different baggages and different issues and different outcomes that we want.
So we always try to tailor it stuff to people. Sure. Well, Dr. Bill, you have a reputation as kind of a root cause guy that gets to the core of issues and doesn't just treat the, the surface condition that is directly related to the complaint. You dig deeper. And in some ways, you remind me of another hero of mine, which is Ivor Cummins, the fat emperor uh, out of Ireland, who talks about root causes and, and root causes of heart disease, root causes of mental conditions. You have that kind of engineering brain that I like so much, that ability to um, really drill down into what's the root cause of the root cause of the root cause for you know something that ostensibly is a headache or a digestive problem or a female disorder or those things that you talked about with your population of, you know, everybody from soccer moms to, you know, to, to your everyday, um, everyday citizen who might have some kind of chronic illness or, or, uh, or injury. And, um, and you, you seem to get to the root and not just have them come back for visit after visit, you really get to the bottom of it. And that's, you're, you're known for that in, in the area among the other doctors. We used to be in some study groups together yeah. and you're, you're known for that in, in that. So I just want to call attention to that. You mentioned your master's degree. Tell us about your other specialties. I, I, I know, I believe you have a, a specialty in injury. Is that right? Oh, uh, yeah. I have a, uh, it, it, you know what? And it's interesting. That was my first delve into functional neurology. So right when I graduated, you know, I had heard about Dr. Carrick, where, you know, you taught and worked with and taught for. Well, let me back up. So I got into chiropractic because of an epileptic condition. So since I was four years old, I was having these seizures and, you know, a lot, a lot of four-year-olds back in the sixties and early seventies would have, you know, the childhood uh, seizures and kind of grow out of them. And they, I mean, they weren't consistent, but it was enough for, and I don't know if it was the treatment protocols at the time, but I was just always on medication. I think they forgot about me for a couple decades as well. They just, Oh, here, take these, any more seizures and, and the like, but it was through chiropractic that one people were explaining to me that, well, are, is, is the medications changing anything? And I was, you know, I, I was all 12, 22 at the time. So I, I knew everything. So I said, well, you know, they're doctors and I'm sure that they have really tests and it's science because he has a white coat and a stethoscope and a BMW. So he must know what he's talking about. And, um, and then when they explained chiropractic, said this nervous system runs everything the brain the body have to uh, communicate with each other body self-healing self-regulating mechanism and i'm like hmm he said you you're not having seizures because there's a deficiency of dilantin in your system he said there's something else going on and i had an atlas out so there was pressure on the brain stem and and you know looking back whether that was a true n of one or what it was but the the belief I had at the time was like, okay, well, let's try this. So we adjusted my neck and we went, I went to see a series of treatment and I saw no appreciable change because I didn't have seizures every day. And it wasn't like I wasn't in all this pain, but I was just curious. And so long story short, my seizures went away. But after a year, I noticed I go, huh, I didn't have any seizures. The year after that, now, this wasn't the doctor. I did this myself, but I took myself off the medication. And that took about another year because I kind of weaned out very, very slowly. And that kind of changed my life. But it got me into this squishy mass that we call the brain and everything else. And I'm like, this is amazing. So once we graduated and I took a little seminar with Dr. Daniel Murphy, he was doing a PI, I think. And he was going through the, the mechanisms of proprioception and pain. And, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. I really didn't care about the PI because I was a student. I didn't know the world of that. So PI is personal injury for those who don't know. And can you oh, tell, yes, us, what, yes, yes, tell yes. us what proprioception is? Proprioception is the body's ability to perceive itself. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe about 80 percent of our, ne our neurology is based around either proprioception or interoception where you know so our nor organs know where they're at and so our brain knows where our body is in time and space and very important that's something that I, 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 I really pay a lot of attention to when we're we're kind of repurposing or retraining the body with the adjustments I'm kind of working that way but a lot of that is the the input from the outer world into the brain and how it how it processes it. But 
yeah, he was, I'm going, oh, I, I, I want to learn more of this. So every month, because we would do a weekend a month and there'd be some testing and this took on about a year, year and a half or something. And uh, we learned all about personal injury, the physics of, of, of injuries. If your head's turned to the left three degrees and what studies, we went pretty deep down the rabbit hole. And that's how I learned to, to handle um, personal injury cases. So, so this is the forensics of, of being hit by a car, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's breaking down every component about how we went through everything from injuries to how, if a car hits this at that vector, how much crap, you know, accident reconstruction, uh, the studies behind that. We went through the treatment protocol, soft tissue, neurological, where to refer out, what to look for, going, going back and forth, expert witnessing to get our point across to what we can. And, and like I said, it was all stemmed in neurology, which, you know, I didn't really care about the other stuff too much until the end. And I, I look back, I'm like, oh, dang, I got a pretty good education for that year. And it was fun. So, Doc, what's your specialty called? What do they call the diplomat? It's a whiplash spinal trauma diplomat. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, it's a diplomat through the ICA, which is the Inter Internal Chiropractic Association. Yeah, that's that's a that's a neat program. I I have always admired that program for it's been around for many years and it's it's just been a very exciting program. Gosh, um, have you found other patients with seizures, or have you spoken to them about um, changes in their lives, whether they're dietary or chiropractic or lifestyle or sleep or? Yeah, yeah, and it and it's funny. The first seizure patient was, it, 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 it was really interesting to me. It was, uh, I had a mom come in and this is how usually it comes in. Somebody comes in, headache, neck pain, back pain through conversation. They hear my story. Well, one of the ladies had, had a son that was about four years old. And she said, oh, well, he's having seizures and he's having trouble in class. And I said, well, I, in, in the, just so everybody, your listeners know, I don't say I cure seizures. I do this. I do that. I don't know. I, I never know going in. I just know that if there's a dysfunction, it can have a disruption. If there's a relationship, I said, we, you know, we run it up the flagpole and seal the solution. So I told her that she brought them in and kids are, when kids get adjustments, it's like what adults want because they don't have years of degeneration, poor patterning, poor neurology. They're usually a fairly quick fix and the younger, the better. So he came in and I think I adjusted him two or three times and mom came back in and, um, and said, Oh my gosh, you know, the teachers are calling. He's so good in class. They think he, that he's on medication. I actually took him off his medication. He's doing so good. And I'm just like, wow. And I adjusted for another couple of times the next week and he goes, he's not having any more seizures and she comes in, she's crying. She goes, it's been, you know, he, he usually has one or two a week or sometimes three. He goes, ever since the second adjustment, he hasn't had any seizures and everything's changed. And she's just over the moon. And it's funny. And I have a pictures of, of him somewhere around that. He looked just like I did at that same, just a little four-year-old toe head. And in my head, I'm like, going, and I go, well, this is why I do what I do, because now I'm affecting his life. If somebody would, it reminded me of Field of Dreams, where the doctor, he, he has to walk over. He said, well, if I would have lived my dream, I would have missed my purpose. And, um, and I, I thought, wow, that's, a pretty, that's pretty wild, too. There was another case that I had, and it was Richard. And we were on some prayer chain, or somebody had told somebody, somebody about me. Anyways, I reached out to him. I said, I don't know if I can help him. I don't know your son, but come on in. Let's see what's going on. And this was the most severe case that I had ever had. And, and when Rich, I thought he was mentally deficient because he came in, he just started having see, it was on tax day. It was on this, uh, April 15th, whatever year it was. Um, but they remember, they go, and he just started having seizures and he wouldn't stop. 
and they put him on so much medication. He had to stop playing with his, his cousins who were his best friends. Um, he had to wear a helmet because if he fell down, they didn't want him hurting. And I'm trying to do the exam and I'm saying, all right, well, Richard, stand up straight. Richard, stand up straight. I'd never met the kid before. So I thought that he had a developmental problem. And I, I said, well, what's wrong with him? He says, well, it's his medications. And he was, I don't even remember that he was on three or four different medications. They were just, they made this kid a zombie. He had three seizures in my office while he was there. Mom's, you know, mom's broken heart. Dad's worried. I, I took him over. I was doing surface EMG at the time, which is you take a look, these little electrodes and you put them right around the side to measure the electric um, activity of the muscles around the spine. And we go down to the different segments and we take a reading and the upper cervical and they just, it's color coded, but if you get red and black, it's usually really bad. So there was a lot of black up there. I said, well, there's definitely a lot of stuff going on. I adjusted him and he got up not big change too much. I checked the pupils, his pupils reacted a little bit better, but still not great. He had another little seizure right before he left the office. I said, come back. And she said that the seizures halved that night. And then I think we adjusted over the next two or three weeks, maybe seven or 10 adjustments. I don't remember specifically. By the second week, they took him off of, mom and dad did this, not on my, my call, uh, took him off one medication, then another. And then by the third week, he was on no more medications and he was having no more seizures. And wow. he wasn't wearing a helmet. He got to go out and play again. And then, um, you know, these, these people were taking a pretty significant drive. So I would just call in and I said, well, you know, maybe get back in. And they came in a month later. Everything was going good. I was just doing a checkup, a follow-up. And then I didn't hear from them. About four months later, I get a, uh, I get a card in the mail. And it was Richard's, it was his report card. And he got straight A's. And in the bottom, it said, Please work with Richard. He talks a lot in class. He's very social. He's where like everything that he wasn't when he was in the office. And I just look back on that and I'm just like, wow. Because if, if they wouldn't have looked for the cause, that was going to be his life unless he just grew out of it. And despite, you know, those neuro drugs, they're pretty devastating. I mean, there's a place for them, I'm sure, but not for an eight-year-old boy. And um, so those, those were a couple of the seizure cases that, I, I, that stick out in my head. I've had others through, through the years. And they're, they're usually, we, I don't remember getting no benefit. Definitely, you know, there's, there's some that seizures have stuck around that was a different problem that I could treat alone. But Yeah, it was very interesting. Very rewarding. There's no, there's, there's no way you could predict ahead of time for either of these children that chiropractic would benefit their seizures. There's no way you could know. But if no. you didn't try, these kids wouldn't have benefited. Yeah, and, and the way I look at it is, well, and I, you have the same philosophy. What's the downside of me adjusting? Of it? There's, no, there's really no downside. Um, and you go into that risk-reward um, factor. So, okay, well, let's, let's try it. It's like drink more water you know there's really don't no downside other than you pee a little bit more with the adjustment and it's just normalizing the nervous system and that's what i like back because we can like i said we can run it up the flagpole and we'll see that benefit and like you say a lot it's not only you know it may not be the cure but it may be a modulator it may it may make everything else that you are doing that is that is controlling the condition uh easier and more efficient which means it's beneficial. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Wow, that's, that, that's just amazing. Have you seen any, any really bad cognitive errors happening 
among patients and their doctors in today's culture right now as you're looking around? Have you seen any anything that alarms you or that disturbs you that that isn't critical thinking or that isn't root cause analysis that really is glaring? Constantly. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's in, in the, the model where we've taken the, the, the hands out of the doctors and they don't even call them doctors anymore because they're healthcare practitioners and it's anybody with a certificate mm. and which a lot of times they're not acting any better than technicians following it in an algorithm and there's no thought process. And a lot of times they're treating the the patient file and not the patient. They forget that there's a person on the other side of that. And, you know, where did personal history go? And where did patient outcomes and pa patient's commitment? One of the reasons that I got into neuro-linguistic program, which is the subconscious influence, and it's actually, they dubbed it the, the, the study of excellence because it's these micro things that you do when, when somebody does something great, there's ways that they do that. And if you copy, if you pattern those ways, you can repeat the action. So it doesn't matter what. But one of the things is, is the, the motivation. Because early on, and I, I spoke yesterday at the International Board of Coaches and Practitioners in Los Angeles. And, and they're all coaches and they're all purposeful but it, it's all mindset stuff. It, it's getting people to, to think better. And it's, it's critical thinking and how to think and getting these little patterns out. But doctors aren't doing that. And, and if you can't teach the patients to make better decisions, because I can tell people to come in and do X, Y, and Z because it's healthier for them. But let's define health. My def definition might be different from theirs. Or somebody might just want to get through the week. And then if their life ends, they're happy. And there is no consequence. Somebody might want to live for 150 years. Let's get these things together. But that's not really critical thinking. It's just... When I had a patient last week was in a car accident. And it wasn't terrible but they were in a lot of pain and they went to an emergency. They didn't do any x-rays. They didn't, they, I, I asked them, I said, well, when they did that, they did, they didn't even do reflexes. They didn't do basic neurological stuff. They said, can you do this? Or this? They gave them the, the, the regular triplicate of, you know, anti-inflammatory pain pills and muscle relaxants, none of which, which addressed the cause. And um, they just tapped them on the head and said, just wait around. But we see that a lot. Even you look at type 2 diabetes. Sometimes the, the practitioners say, well, just take your insulin, your metformin, and, and do what you can. And they say, watch your diet and exercise, but they don't tell them what a diet and exercise is. And sort of with the, in the doctor's defense is... You know, they're only allocated five minutes with their, their patient. And if the patient says, well, my neck hurts and my arm's tingling, they, well, that's arm is a different visit. You have to come in and they segment, they make everything very Newtonian, like we are just levers and pulleys. And that's not how the body works. And as doctors, they know that. And, and yeah, it's, I think that's why. I'm very proud of my Yelp reviews and, and Google reviews and things like that, because you'll look through that. I take the time with the patients. Yeah. Um, and simply because I, I just like, I like my patients and I want, I, I want, I want them to live the best version of their lives. And so I want to give them the best, you know, doctors, we're just consultants really. I mean, and we have some tools in our bag that, that we can do, but let's give them what they Let's give them what they want and show them what's possible. And, and they're not getting that. And, oh, my, you know, the, the insurance that some of these people are paying, a $5,000 or $10,000 deductible on top of if they get through that, then uh, they have their 20% copay. And they're not even getting quality 
you know, care. They're not getting quality service for their money. I'm just like, wow, wow. It just, yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Do you, um, do you have any advice you would give someone who has a chronic condition? Maybe they've been, you know, injured and, and, and released from care and it's a lo- it's an old cold injury, or they've got some visceral complaint, like a, like a, a diabetes thing or a digestive thing or a female disorder, something old and cold and chronic. What would you advise the typical American who has some kind of condition that's old and cold and chronic? What would you tell them as advice in this environment that we live in in the United States? Yeah, you know, the, the very first thing I would say is, is go do some cursory research and see what's possible. Because a lot of people, you know, I, I hear it all, all the time. So, well, I have arthritis, so there's nothing you can do about it. He was like, what type of arthritis? Where's it at? How long it's been there with it? And they think that they've, because they've given a label that that's what it is. So an old chronic something is first go look for the answer because, you know, usually whatever we focus on, we, we can, we can find, you know, I'm not going to get something that's going to make a uh, 74 year old woman, you know, moving around like a 22 year old uninjured person, but first believe that there's something out there and then go and search it out because, and go to functional medicine or functional neurology or somebody will take the time with you and look at, all right, what can we improve? Let's not even say cure. Let's just say, well, if we can improve the way that your, your nerve flow goes by 5% and we can improve your, your blood flow, another 5%, we'll get your diet up 5%. We get you moving 5% better. We get you 5% five, 5 more efficient in all of these things. We get your foundations of health, with, which is your, your, your sleep, your sunshine, your movement, your, your elimination system, you know, your, your stress relief, all down by five, 5%, five which is not a big deal, but those become cumulative. And I get this with patients all the time. Just do, do this much just across the board. Yeah. And what I've seen most of the time when that happens is they go, wow, I can climb one flight of stairs. Well, good. How long does it take you? Well, it takes me 20 seconds. All right. So next week, I want you to do it in 18 seconds. And then the week after that, I want you to do it in 17 seconds. And then I want you to do two flights of stairs. And I've had people that were, you know, they were basically watching Jeopardy and just sitting around and um, sitting in the chairs just waiting for uh for the end that are run walking 5ks or doing a spartan race or just doing their own shopping but they're getting their lives back first know that it's possible and then go out and find somebody that'll help you yeah, you be, know- willing, here's the other, <laughs> be willing to invest in in a good doctor i you know we get a lot of well that's possible well will insurance pay for it no this is your life This is your responsible. And I like the cash patients, not because it's, it's just good for business, but because the outcomes are better because once you have psychological skin in the game and once you say, because money is just a, it's just a current, it's just a representation of your energy. And so if I say, I'm going to give you this because I care so much about my health. And if they do this, then they'll take that supplement and then they won't forget to do their stretches and their exercises and, and the other things. Yeah. Gosh. Well, you know that you, you said something like this years ago in a study group, you said something like uh, age is not a pathology. You were, you were talking to a group of us that were studying in your office in your Berlin. Mm-hmm. And you said something like age is not a pathology. And that struck me as very wise because, you know, once you're 80 or something, you start thinking, well, how well can I be? And I've seen, 80 year olds turn around beautifully. And I'm sure you have in your 25 years of practice, it's, um, it's an, it's a neat thing. Um, well, and you know, I, I was talking yesterday as part of the thing was, I was talking about pathology and, um, and we don't really have pathology so much as we have adaptive physiology. And if we take it from that standpoint first, is so what's your body adapting to? Cause the body will adapt to applied demands. So if sugar's going up constantly, so why is that? 
it's either adapting to what's coming in or how you're not moving or how you are moving or the nervous system or something. And uh, I, you know, with all the research and all the new tools that we have that are constantly coming out, if we can just get it to the general public and in a lot of it, it's like I said, it's, it's education and, and motivation on the patient's thing, but we're so stressed out as a society that, you know, if, do I have a job? Are we going to be locked down again? Or are we going to do this? Or we're like this, what's this mean that we're, we've been living in survival mode and we don't grow in survival mode. Yeah. Gosh. Wow, that, that, that whole neuro-linguistic programming fascinates me. I think that's, that's so neat. You have such a science approach to that, which I like. Um, that, that appeals to me. Gosh. I'd like to know, who are some of your favorite people that inspire you? There's YouTube and there's Instagram and there's all this world of, of media that we've discovered in this COVID world that, that uh, I think some of us have used to inspire ourselves. And you, you have a reputation for being very very driven and very strong and very capable. What people do you look to for inspiration and positive influence for yourself to keep you going? And, and what would you tell people to look for out there? Who, who do you like and, and what do you watch? I'm always asking that question because I learn so much when people tell me, oh, I love this channel or that person. And I discover it and I'm just so happy that I learned who that person was. I never heard of them before. And I think it's amazing. Yeah, the uh, Andy Frizzelli is something that I'm listening to on his podcast. It's the uh, AF Entrepreneur or something, but it's it's very down and dirty and gritty. I'm a big David Goggins fan. He doesn't really have a podcast, but you can see a lot of his videos. A great book called Can't Hurt Me that he wrote. And I'm, and I'm like, who is this guy? Is it, It's a Navy SEAL, and he cusses a lot. But his story and a lot of the stuff that I, that I learn about, he's learned the same. So I learned it academically. He just grit and ground and, and learned it through, you know, carrying his own cross and, and coming out the other end and just sharing it. To this day, he just does not care what people think. And it's very, very motivational. Jocko uh, Willinks is a good one, the Jocko podcast. He's another ex-Navy SEAL who's gotten into a business coaching and he, he's leadership. I, I love Andrew Huberman, the Huberman Lab podcast, which is a lot of neurology. It, it's very geeky. He, he tries to put, and he succeeds fairly well in putting higher level neurology stuff into kind of workable stuff but you know as you know once you get into the weeds it's hard to keep it very simple but uh i learn a lot from that i like jordan peterson just from the way that he approaches stuff he's he's uh, very academic but he'll make a statement and then he always backs it up with some references or some analogies the like i'm a big tony robbins guy and people, a lot of, I like Tony because people think he's a motivational speaker and he's not a motivational speaker. He was, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, cutting edge on technologies. Neurolinguistics is one of them. He was the first person that I'm going like, what, how does he do this? And how's he cut through and how he know that? And, and he basically was one of the first major students of neurolinguistic programming. And oh, yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. And he, and he actually, he never said NLP. He actually changed the name and, and used his own, and what is it, neuro, neuro-linguistic conditioning. Anyways, he, he changed it, but he became very good at, at what he stuff. But he, it's always strategies. And he's gone from, you know, personal motivation and inspiration and breakthrough stuff to uh, relationships to time management to now he's doing finances it's it's the same model where you just break break down the system it's the same it's the same model of like I said NLP which there's little things that you can break down and you can do this in any any field because there's all micro fractal systems 
And so if I want to learn quilting, it's going to be the same process as if I was going to do computer software engineering. And um, so I, I like Tony for that. But you know what? I, I like my friends. And it's something I've learned, too, is that um, my core friend group gets smaller and smaller and smaller as we have different conversations than, you know, how was the weather? So I like to have these conversations, somebody that, you know, we, we work with. Like I said, I have a lot of friends that are in personal development or they're authors or something, but people that are always thinking in future, we're always striving for the next step. Yeah. And we all have problems, but, you know, we kind of work those out as well. You have a neat theme that I've observed, which is you know, you, you seem to borrow it from the military folks and from the, from the, um, from the, the business achiever folks. And, and you, you seem to move very fluidly between those realms. And that is, in my observation, you teach your patients and your clients and yourself how to control your mind and your body. And I don't mean control like wrangle. I mean, like manage, like, you know, you keep, we're taught to keep our cars clean, our bodies clean, our houses and yards clean enough to keep them, you know, manageable and usable. And, and you, you are always teaching people how to, how to manage their body chemistry, how to manage their sleep, how to manage their thoughts, how to not let things just go because Americans really do tend to let things go and then ask for somebody else to come along and fix it for them. Oh, and yeah. you, you empower people a lot through, through very solid mechanisms and, and, and not, it's not just hand waving, it's, it's mechanisms to help them control and, and manage and rein in whatever's gone, you know, to an extreme, whether it's their blood sugar or their exercise or their weight, you've done a lot of work with weight loss. And, and, um, and of course, this whole mental thing you just talked about how to keep your mind from just going off. It's, it's so easy in today's environment to let your brain just go and worry and wonder and, and obsess and fear and, and just cycle like a hamster wheel. Yeah, it's, um, and I, and I do that because I'm such a mess. Um, just personally, because, well, and it's true. I mean, we're all a mess and, and the world's full of entropy and, and left to its own devices, it breaks down to chaos. The more that we can, and like I said, not control, not be so rigid that, that life is not fun. If anybody's hung around with me, I'm a knucklehead and I'm off the side. I have no filter and it, and it really doesn't matter. But I do that because that's what I like, like to do. But everything is a struggle. And we're under this misnomer in our lives that we're supposed to be comfortable. And back when I told you the story about you know, my mouth said yes, and my body said no to write the book. And I said, well, this is what my, my growth feels like, because I'm scared, you know, out of my seat. But every time you think about it, Mike, is every time we do something hard, and we sweat, or, or we're figuring out a paper, or we're trying to learn something, and it's frustrating like that. And then when we finally get it at the end, we go, wow, once we expand to a certain level, whether it's our, our health or our relationships, or, you know, our, our knowledge base, we, we never shrink again. And, and we never know what's on the other side until we get to the peak. And then we just find out there's another hill, but we needed all those tools that we just learned to get to the next mountain. And you can stop anytime you want to, but like, if, if we only have one trip around this big blue marble, I don't want to live it in fear of like, oh, what are they going to say about my Instagram post? Or, oh, I wish I would have worked a little harder, um, you know, at the gym or, or whatever, all the possibilities that I'm supposed to do here in this world. If I can't, if I can't get out of bed, you know, how am I going to go and, you know, do whatever I'm supposed to do? And everybody's supposed to do or purpose here is, is, is different, but Honestly, it's because I'm a, I have pictures on my mirrors over that says, you know, you know, don't be a wuss today, go out and, and do something because my biggest fear is being the biggest world's biggest hypocrite. I know people, like I said, I know a lot of people in personal development. And I not I know some fairly well known people that you go behind the curtain. You go, 
didn't you just spend an hour telling people not to do exactly what you do every day? And it, and not that we're perfect, not that we're perfect, but but when you're living south, when you tell everyone to go north, I don't like the hypocrisy. And so like, I don't want to be a philosophy, a philosopher, I want to be a practitioner. So if I tell my patients, you know, go out and do that other rep, it hurts. It's because like I do the uh, extra rep and it, and I know it hurts and I know that it'll be worth it. So I, other than the female hormonal stuff, I do everything in the office first before I introduce it to any patients. And, you know, it's, it's an N of one and it's a different N of one, but I'm not going to take this supplement or recommend this supplement if, if I didn't take it. So that's, that's what I like to do because I don't think health is just making sure that your lab results are within a normal range. Well, you're a fit guy and you're over 50. How do yep. you eat? How do, how do you eat? What, do, what are you doing? And I, I realize that everybody's diet may be different, but what, what do you eat and how do you address this world that we live in and this body that we're given? And, and, um, and how do you eat right now? What, what do you like? And, and what are you noticing about your body uh, as you eat and as you tell people what to eat? I notice for being a big hippie myself and being, be, being, you know, cognizant of, of my diet is um, I, I can't, I don't tolerate sugar. I, I mean, I can have a little something here and there and I don't de deprive myself, but I just don't seek out my, my house isn't filled with, you know, a lot of crap. I have kids, so crap gets put in, but, um, but I, but I find if I have like a couple off the rails meals in a row or a few over the weekend, I'm just very lethargic and, and I feel the difference. One of the best things that the apex, the glycin, it's a supplement from a company apex energetics is one of the best things that if I have to reboot myself, I do that. But like I do a lot of intermittent fasting and it's not always like planned uh, on days that I don't work out. If I eat breakfast, I generally have, my daughters call it the, um, the bird seed meal. So I make a, uh, rather than cereal, I'll, I'll have uh, uh, usually crushed walnuts or pecans or some sort of nut. I'll have some hemp. Um, I'll have some oatmeal or oat milk or if I can get raw goat milk and it lasts a long, I'll put that in it with some sort of berry. And usually a cup, maybe a cup and a half, and I'll have some uh, coffee with that. And then I'm pretty much good till lunch. Lunch, if I'm working out, usually I'll have a uh, protein shake after my workout. You eat meat and saturated fat, don't you? Oh, yeah. Are yeah, you into yeah, that? Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so now you we're talking the heavy stuff. Now we'll go back into... So I have a nice smoker outside and I, oh, love sure. ribs. I love ribs. I love Wagyu. If you can get me a Wagyu steak, I'll be your best friend forever. Um, what makes me feel best is red meat and saturated fat. Okay. Okay. And, um, and the better the steak. And I try to get the, the foods that I eat is clean. And it's, it's a misnomer that eating good, clean food is expensive. Because what happens doing it is if you just take the money to buy the food, you'll buy less, but you need less because the body doesn't crave calories. It craves, it, it craves nutrients. And um, we'll get that. I, I like all sorts of salads, different colors. Um, yeah. And then yeah, uh, this, this bottomless pit of cravings that I see American patients frequently having is something that you, you have done a good job of curbing with your patients and your population because you have a weight loss practice as well as a fitness practice and and as well as a chronically ill and injury practice so i've seen this this phenomenon where you unlike a lot of practitioners have got your patients moved where they don't have that bottomless pit anymore where they just say i if i don't stop myself i eat meat, meat i'm actually satisfied i've reached satiety and that seems like it's really hard for doctors and patients to learn well, you know, you know, what's interesting is that when, when I do like my weight loss course that, that we have is I'll talk to people, 
I know very few people. I and I actually can't remember any specific. I know there are, but I can't remember any specific. Who eats because they're always hungry? That's a rare condition to actually have that bent going on. People eat because they're bored, because it's something that they can control. They may not. You know, you watch the people at work, and then the boss yells at them. They're no longer in control of their time. What they can control is how many times they reach for the M&M bowl that's constantly on their desk. Yeah. Uh, and they eat unconsciously. And, you know, it's like the people that used to, we don't smoke that much anymore, but there would be a trigger. The telephone would ring. And I used to watch my mom do this and she'd pick up a cigarette. Oh, yes. And, or um, it would be automatically, uh, they'd have a conversation. It'd be a cigarette or... Uh, she'd yell at me for something because I was always doing something. And then there was a cigarette. It was always, it was a trigger response and they would always go, but people are doing that with, with food now. And we have so many such food available that it's, they're always eating and they eat unconsciously. And I think that's where a lot of people get issues from. And then it's because they eat so poorly that they crave something that uh that's actually not good for you and i and i tell people that a lot of times i'll see in the, the practice is the people that are craving something is exactly the thing that they're intolerant to and they go how does that be and i i and i learned this from my buddy glenn depke his naturopath you know because they'll get that stress like from gluten they'll get that stress response and the the cortisol break down to cortisone which will anesthetize the people so they subconsciously will feel better and and i tell the patient i said it's like you know those people that cut they you said why are you cutting yourself they go what well, makes me feel better how does sticking a razor in your arm make you feel better and it's the same mechanism and if we can get them off of whatever they're they're intolerant to 72 hours or a week and we get them on a, we replace their foods with something else and they start feeling better, they never go back unless wow. they're under stress. Well, Bill, you're, you're such an inspiring and fun person to work with that, you know, there are, there are brilliant doctors and there are brilliant artists and brilliant business people, but they're not fun to work with all the time. And, and the neat thing about you that I like is that you're fun to work with. <laughs> If well, I have something you. wrong or, or if I'm a patient, I'm, I'm going to enjoy the heck out of the experience. And I think that's for the millennials. That's one of the biggest things right now is what is the experience like? What does it feel like to do something, whether it's to go to Disneyland or whether it's to go to a doctor's office or what or go buy shoes? The experience, whether it's online or live, is, is, is where it's at for the millennials. And, um, and I, I really think they're onto something. Maybe our generation didn't quite catch and I like that they're doing that. There's lots of stuff that I don't love about what some of them are doing, but generally <laughs> this is a really good, this is a really good trend that they're doing. And, and I want to encourage that, that, you know, when people go see you, there's, there's a human being behind the, behind the, the doctor's coat and, and, um, and, and all of those um, qualifications and all those um, specialties and degrees and licenses that you have. Well, the, so we, we train the staff and I've said this for years, it really doesn't matter how good I am or I are in whether I'm good or not it doesn't really matter it is the experience and and I train the staff I said you know there's a person people get caught up in their jobs I got to check this I got to take the credit card I got to bill this do you have the ninja if you go to your, your medical doctor you walk in and it's really quiet and you have to be careful it's like a library it's like you're going in, in or a church and you sit there and they have that frosted glass you know, then, you know, Nurse Ratchet would go, hey there, what you doing there, Nurse Ratchet? Would you? And they'll, they'll say, I'll take your copay now. And then they'll come back over. It's very cold and it's very dark and nobody enjoys going over there. It's, it's white. It's, it's just old magazines and, and terrible. So we have an open concept because I want, that's how I want the relationship. It's a metaphor for how we want our relationship. I have private rooms and stuff that we do our consults and everything else, but um, I want my office experience to be like a cocktail party, a little higher energy, little, um, little banter back and forth. And I get patients that schedule this 
around the same time so they can chat with each other. Um, so the other reason is it if somebody is asking a question and I said, oh, that's a good question. I can pop my head over. You know, we have these barriers, but if I pop my head up and I speak up, everybody can hear. And I said, hey, Sally just had a, had a great question. Did, did you ever wonder why, you know, your pinky toe doesn't work? Or, and they'll look up and then I'll say that and then I'll go back to work. But if I didn't have that environment and then they would laugh about something, um, one of the things is, is to put them in a good mood. And if we're happy, and I'm happy with doing what I'm doing, then they're happy. It's you create a, a subconscious expectation when they when you walk into the office. And I tell the staff, I said, this should be a Disney experience. You, you, you know, they come in, it should be a magical time that they're giving us their time. And they want something out of that. And ultimately, you know, we don't treat pain, we don't treat everything else, because the most important thing is that we're giving people time. And it's, it's either the time that they're going to enjoy doing something because their back or their neck hurts, or they can't do their headache, or they're, we're going to give them time with their children, or we're going to give them more longevity to do it's not how long you will live, it's how you live. And that's all in time based. So while they're here, they should feel appreciated, and they should be supported and heard. Gosh. Well, thank you. It's been a fantastic time together with you. And if, if those of you that have not met Dr. Bill have, have, have a chance, you've got to go to Yorba Linda, California in Orange County. You've got to visit the practice. You've got to see him online. You've got to see him in his lectures for the Coaching Association, see his best-selling book. You've got to check out his, his work with the LA Tribune. And uh, if you can get a chance to visit him in person, you really need to. Dr. Bill Janicek, thank you so much for your uh, time my today. Pleasure. I think we need to do a panel discussion with some of our buddies in the future and maybe a oh, glass of wine awesome. while we do it. <laughs> yeah, that, that would, that would be way cool. I look forward to it. So I, I just, I'm appreciative of you having me on here. This is, I always enjoy talking to you. Like you said, you're one of my, when I grow up, I want to be Michael Pierce. <laughs> oh, Bill, thank you. But Good I'm luck. never going to grow up. <laughs> <laughs> That's great.